All right, welcome everyone to the December installment of the IPM Hour. Uh, today we have uh, two speakers joining us, uh, one from California, the other from Alaska. The first is Michael Blankenship, who is the president of Blankenship and Associates, an environmental and engineering firm uh, focused on risk communication, uh, water resource management, and regulatory compliance. The firm is based in Davis, California, and their client list includes, let's see, now I, I went through it as best I could, but this is, this is a, a ballpark estimate. 10 counties, 20 cities, and I couldn't even count the number of water districts. And as anyone who can tell you, uh, who has worked in the regulatory compliance area in California, the regulatory environment here is complex and restrictions can be tight. So I imagine Michael has his work cut out for him. Uh, Michael received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from St. Michael's College in Colchester, Vermont, and a master's degree in environmental chemistry from University of California, Davis. Michael is licensed as a pest control advisor here in California. I think I got that right, right? Yep. Yes. Uh, and today he'll talk about developing IPM plans for municipalities. Take it away, Michael. Great. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Um, I uh, am happy to be here. Glad to share a few tidbits in regard to IPM plans for municipalities. And Matt, I'm not sure how you'd like to work it, but if uh, any of the folks on the on the Zoom call today have questions or comments that they'd like to offer up through the course of the talk, I'm happy to entertain those. Or if you'd prefer that we do that at the end, I'm uh, happy to do that too. So I'll leave that up to you, Matt. Either way you want to do it, I'll monitor the chat and let you know if anything pops up there. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, well, let's get started. Um, the idea here is to spend about mm, 20 minutes, maybe 25, uh, on a, a handful of slides that address this topic of uh, IPM plans for municipalities, lessons learned. And, and I say this in, in the context of lessons learned in the sense that uh, we've had an opportunity to work with a whole number of municipalities over the last, oh, say 15 years. And uh, we thought we knew a lot when we started, but boy, did we not. Uh, so we've learned a ton. And uh, the idea here is to maybe share some insights for this kind of work with you this morning. So the, the talk is broken down into four Michael, categories. Sorry? You're not sharing your slides yet. Oh, I'm not. Okay. I should try to do that. Uh, Sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. Let me... Uh, Make sure we have the right slide deck going here. How about that? Can you say, uh, see the slide that says today's talk? All right, that's a that's an improvement. <laughs> okay, so uh, today's talk, four major uh, content elements here. IPM, why bother? What are the motivations for uh, having an IPM plan and executing an IPM plan? Who are the players and what do they have to say about this? Uh, what are some of the common themes amongst these players and the things that they hear and the things that they say? And then perhaps the tools that are suggestions for you to consider uh, as you march down this IPM path. Okay, uh, the need for IPM. Uh, well, there's a variety of different needs. Uh, here's just a handful. Uh, if you're from California, this whole idea of fire fuel reduction is a big deal. And the protection of infrastructure uh, in and around places that can burn uh, is, is critically important, particularly if that infrastructure has something to do with water, power, uh, communications, things of that nature. That, of course, dovetails in with public safety uh, in order to stay safe, whether you're looking for defensible space around your home, your office, uh, the management of education around uh, your home or your office, place of work, infrastructure is all very important, uh, which dovetails into infrastructure access, which is uh, also critical. If you are, for example, working for a water district who's operating a pump station, uh, or you're working for a fire district who's got to make sure that their fire station is safe. Uh, flood control is another concern, uh, making sure that there's not vegetation that's in and around flood facilities uh, such that water flows where you want it and doesn't go where you don't want it. Uh, and then of course, the concept of aesthetics is an important one where 
Uh, if you're looking to go watch a baseball game or play baseball, uh, you're, you're looking for a good looking infield, a good looking outfield, the area around the bleachers, you would hope to have uh, good looking grass that's adequately mowed and, and weed whipped, et cetera. So these are just some of the things that uh, you could almost translate into the benefits of IPM. And oftentimes that's what we try to uh, bring people up to speed on where they might think that any of these five elements of managing uh, a city or a county infrastructure just happen on its own. I don't necessarily realize and acknowledge that people spend time doing this. So give you a little bit of insight as to maybe three gross categories of some of the players in regard to IPM planning and execution. We'll talk a little bit about the perspective of the practitioners, the people that are actually out there doing the work. Elected and appointed officials, uh, these also would include uh, salaried government staff that have some role to play in the administration of city or county governance. And then the general public, which also includes uh, sometimes single issue advocacy groups where they feel strongly about uh, one or more particular issues surrounding IPM. So let's uh, take into account that these single issue groups oftentimes include uh, people of this nature who uh, for a variety of reasons that we'll get into later, uh, don't look kindly on the use of uh, pesticides as a part of the IPM toolbox that we know to be uh, necessary to manage vegetation and more on that later. Okay, so the general public, what is it that you might expect for them to say about IPM? Well, um, as I alluded to earlier, I think a lot of folks just don't know that it's happening. It's just a uh, a background bit of maybe not even noise that occurs to keep uh, city or county uh, infrastructure up and running. I didn't know you did that or you needed to do that. That being say, in this case, vegetation management. Uh, certainly the, the general public wants to be kept safe and that might translate to uh, don't allow vegetation to grow up in and around uh, a stop sign, for example, so that a line of sight can be maintained. Uh, as, a, as an example of how the, the public wants to be kept safe. And then of course, they wanna be able to play, whether that's at a ball field or a golf course uh, or an open space, there's an expectation created because those spaces have been created that people can use them and the public wants to have that ability. Practitioners, what is it that a practitioner might say to you about IPM? Well, they also wanna be kept safe and that might translate to uh, be sure that the mower that I'm using has adequate safety devices on it and it's maintained correctly and that uh, I have the proper PPE to be worn while I'm using it, uh, which translates to it better work. If you're gonna ask me to weed whip, I would want you to give me equipment that is going to be sure that, uh, that my job can get accomplished. And then I think one element of a uh, common theme that we've heard a lot amongst practitioners is they, they're proud of their work. They're glad to uh, make a ball field look good or a rain side uh, look viewable or a median strip look tidy. Uh, they like to feel good about their work. There's absolutely a, a sense of pride I, I, that we've, uh, we've experienced when we're talking about people that manage uh, using this example as vegetation. And then you talk to perhaps the, the folks in, in an administrative role. Uh, or maybe a political group who have some uh, something to say about how IPM is operating. And, and, and certainly these are two themes that we hear all the time. And they might not actually say, make me look good, but that's certainly part of what they hope to have happen is that uh, through this IPM process, they wanna make sure that um, they're seen as uh, heroes and that what they're doing is uh, part of uh, making their their, their city or county be better than it was without them. And of course, there's the money element where uh, there's lots of expenses, uh, maybe less taxes given uh, our current circumstance with COVID, um, where the amount of money available to perform IPM uh, may not be as much as the practitioners would like. And so this concept of budget often comes up and is uh, often a sticky point. So those are the three groups that uh, we often hear from, and, and those are some of the thoughts that they, they often offer up. So maybe another take on what is said is that if a practitioner 
pardon me, were to say, we practice IPM. Uh, we follow UC guidance. Uh, we manipulate the, the, the approach that we take based on our particular pest pressures. And, and that's what we do. Well, oftentimes what the audience hears is you use pesticides. Uh, they often re reveal that if you're doing anything to manage pests, uh, it has something to do with applying a, a, a herbicide or you're using rodenticides to manage vertebrate pests. Uh, they're really unaware of other tools that are often being employed. Uh, and then often, particularly related to pesticide use, their, their reaction is you're not keeping me safe. You're just not doing what uh, I would do if I had to do this kind of work. And so the, the quote that you see to the right is a, a snippet from an email that I got from a, an advocacy group that I think summarizes a couple of key issues. Uh, and, and so let me read this briefly. Thanks, Mike. That looks like val a valuable resource for experts such as you. And so what I sent to this, this person was a, a peer reviewed publication on IPM that talked about the integration of a variety of different tools to manage vegetation. So the take home here, I think, is this is way too complicated, Mike. It's only for experts like you to be consumed by. I don't understand it. You can't expect me to. Please explain it to me. And so in the process of trying to explain issues like, for example, glyphosate, uh, this, this person replied in, in addition to that first paragraph, the second paragraph, well, I don't think that I'm advocating for you to, for you to use substitutes to glyphosate, but I am pretty sure whatever it is you use is likely to be more toxic. In other words, you're not keeping me safe. So this refrain is not uncommon at all uh, amongst certain members of the public that uh, have a particular um, pre predisposed outlook on the use of pesticides. Um, so this theme of safety or feeling safe through the course of uh, managing pests I think has a couple of uh, common themes that we've come across, and, and here they are. Uh, I think the public doesn't generally feel like they can control the approach or the outcome of the uh, pest management practices that are being undertaken. And so because they can't control it, they're not feeling like they can uh, chart their own course and, and manage their own destiny. And so as a result, don't feel safe. Uh, as that snippet I shared with you earlier alluded to, not a lot of people, and understandably so, don't understand the science of uh, pest management uh, and, and whether that means that they don't understand wasps and, and how uh, they can be controlled or they don't understand vegetation. Uh, those are examples of uh, how people just don't quite get it and they rely on people to help them. Then of course, glyphosate has uh, been in the headlines for a significant amount of time and significant amount of uh, energy has been spent on trying to defend it, and there's clearly been cases where glyphosate has been uh, judged against and awards being given for those that are, uh, have claimed being damaged by it. And so that's certainly raised the, the specter of IPM and the use of herbicides in IPM, and, and that's not for uh, lack of headlines that this has happened. Uh, just recently, as some of you might have heard, and this is really quite recently, within the last few days, is that uh, some organic herbicides, one called Weed Slayer, uh, which is often combined with a fertilizer referred to as Agro Gold, uh, has been investigated. And as it turns out, uh, the, the claim that Weed Slayer uh, Agro Gold combination makes is that you use these uh, these materials, eugenol is the active ingredient in, in weed slayer. It smells really good. And the concept here is that it slays weeds, but it slays them a lot better if you combine them with the uh, Part B fertilizer called Agro Gold. And so the, the, the approach that this company has taken is that uh, we have two products that combined and then applied uh, works quite well in the management of weeds. Well, as it turns out, uh, just recently, the Department of Food and Agriculture here in California has identified uh, a couple of things in uh, agro gold that uh, are, best, are, in, are herbicides, um, diquat and glyphosate. So that maybe then would start people to ask the question, of, can we even trust these organic folks, the people that are trying to develop materials that uh, 
are meant to be safer because they're organic, which then leads to the very common uh, concept that people have in their head that just because something's organic, it must necessarily be safer. So these are just some uh, snippets, some ideas, some, some, some uh, thoughts that we've heard time and time again as to the reasons for feeling unsafe. Well, then if you're, if you're acknowledging that people may not feel safe with regard to the methods being used to manifest, the question then becomes is, well, how can we, how can we bridge that gap? How can we communicate about the safety of the techniques used to manage tests in our cities and counties? Well, um, here's just a couple of tidbits that we've just come to realize are important parts of that communication process. Uh, once it, one, one concept here is seek first to understand, then to be understood, which comes from uh, Stephen Covey in a, in a book that he wrote long ago and one of the tenants in that book. So although it's, it's difficult to sometimes suppress the urge to uh, bombard people with uh, all the science maybe we are aware of uh, as to how a pest grows, how, what its life cycle is, uh, how we manage it, we uh, have to bite our tongue. We really need to. We need really to sit down with folks that have concerns and listen very carefully about what it is that's on their mind before we offer up some of the technical knowledge that we have, which of course then dovetails to being open and honest and transparent, uh, which then of course dovetails into just being patient, which is a big part of seeking first to understand. Ultimately, agreeing to disagree is, is uh, not an uncommon conclusion to some of the discussions that we've had with, uh, with the general public. But I would say that the, the process of undertaking these, these four bullets starts to develop a rapport with folks, starts to develop some level of trust. It may be that you'll never be able to convince people uh, of why it is we do what we do, but the idea here is that through that process of dialogue, some trust is developed. Um, some more tips about communicating about safety. We, we've learned to take into account this idea, uh, which oftentimes is confusing, and it's the, the terms are often flip-flopped and, and used incorrectly, but that's this idea of introducing the concepts of hazard versus risk. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, here in just the next few slides. And, and this is perhaps something that would people would think were, would be necessarily only applicable to the use of uh, pesticides, but that's not true. It's applicable to the use of mechanical, biological, and cultural controls at IPM. And so uh, let's, let's take a second and explore this idea of hazard versus risk. So here's maybe some analogies that we can all relate to uh, that help differentiate the, the, these concepts of hazard versus risk. So a hazard might be that you're having some bones in the fish that you're about to eat. And, and if you were to just look at that fish and the bones on its uh, body sitting on your plate, that would be a hazard. It's not until you elect to have a bite of that fish uh, and how much of that fish you eat and how often you eat it, that that hazard then becomes a risk. And that of course is as a result of your exposure. Well, uh, and we'll explore this detail in a minute, uh, is the, this concept of uh, bacteria or viruses or parasites uh, in the food that we eat. And of course, as COVID's led us to know more about the air that we breathe. So again, these are hazards until we have some exposure to them that then turns them into a risk. And then of course, the, the category of chemicals uh, that exist in the food that we eat, say for example, mercury and fish, uh, or acrylamide in the French fries that we just bought from McDonald's, uh, those of course are not going to be risked until we decide to expose ourselves to eating them. So getting into a detail, uh, Campylobacter is a very common bacteria in uncooked meat and in particular in chicken. And it's there, it's absolutely there. You can culture, sample for it and culture it and grow it uh, without difficulty at all. Uh, but without licking your fingers after handling that food or perhaps eating that food without it being thoroughly cooked, it is merely a hazard. It's not until we have an exposure to that, that particular uh, material, this, this particular biohazard, that we uh, experience a risk. 
So again, this idea of exposure uh, is the bridge, if you will, that gets us from a hazard to a risk. Uh, another example is uh, salmonella in eggs. Um, a raw egg has, or could have, not always, but could have some salmonella in it. And so if you were to eat it raw, uh, you would increase your exposure from that hazard, the presence of that bacteria, to ultimately becoming a risk. That risk is minimized if you were to cook it. And so the chance of exposure is lessened and the risk accordingly is also lessened. As I mentioned, the, this idea of hazard and risk, of course, is, is applicable to non-chemical exposures as it is to, say, a, a physical exposure, say, for example, an electric fence. Uh, for those that have had an opportunity to touch an electric fence, it sure doesn't seem like it's much of a hazard uh, until you touch it, in which case it turns into a risk. Uh, it's not a big risk, but it's certainly one that gets your attention. Uh, and, and so this concept of exposure, if you don't touch the fence, you won't have a risk is uh, part of what we try to train animals to believe when we're fencing them into graze in a particular area. Uh, that having been said, we, we talked a little bit about uh, the need for practitioners to be safe. And so the idea of uh, making sure there's guards on rotating pieces of equipment is one way to mitigate and differentiate between a hazard and a risk. Okay, so that having been said, I think the concept here, the take home message here is if you can manage exposure to a hazard, you can manage risk, which ultimately increases your safety. And so it's this, this chain of events, if you will, or this linkage between exposure, risk, and safety that we spend a lot of time talking to people about. Again, not looking to convince them, not looking necessarily to win them over. They may never be won over, but this idea of having some open dialogue on these concepts uh, we've found has, has resulted in some rapport being built and some trust being, as a result, derived. Okay, well, some uh, additional communication tips that we've found to be very useful. Uh, two of them that I'll take a second here and talk a little bit about. Uh, field demonstrations and volunteer days. So uh, the slide that you show, that I show to, to the right here, uh, shows an example of a field demonstration day. In this particular example, uh, the people that we're demonstrating uh, vegetation control to uh, are people from regulatory agencies. And it might be hard to see, but you can, uh, you can make out before it was changed to Fish and Wildlife. The folks at California Department of Fish and Game, back before they changed the name, uh, sported these uh, very stylish sweatshirts. And you can see that uh, one of their staff is wearing them there. Uh, and so there's a handful of folks from uh, one of our clients, uh, Sacramento County, and uh, a handful of regulators that we took out and said, listen, uh, the, the ground that we're standing on was mowed. And it was mowed with a flail mower. And this is how a flail mower works. Uh, there is areas around the, the pathway that you can see that uh, depending on uh, how well the flail mowing works, we may elect to use herbicides. Uh, and so it was a chance to introduced to them this idea that without the use of some mechanical tools and the potential use of some uh, herbicide tools, the, the ground that's being uh, managed and the expectation the public has for this ground is recreational is difficult to meet these expectations without some implementation of IPM. So a great opportunity to get some people up to speed. Uh, another opportunity to get folks up to speed is to do volunteer days. And so this is a, a photo taken from one of our clients, East Bay Regional Park District, which is in the, generally in the Oakland area, uh, where uh, people are being invited out to get a sense for what does it take to make a park look good? Where can we, for example, manually remove weeds and go ahead and plant something that uh, is maybe a more desirable, uh, a more desirable vegetative species? So these are great tools to get the public out, uh, parents with their kids, listening, watching, observing, uh, what does it take to make our parks look good and, and be proud of them. So uh, uh, we found this to be a, a great way to get folks involved. I will say, however, uh, that uh, the enthusiasm is high, often for the first hour or two of uh, events of this nature. Uh, and then, for example, when you take out uh, some rakes uh, or a weed wrench 
and you actually start uh, working on uh, these kinds of challenges, uh, enthusiasm often drops off. So uh, we often take this, uh, even though the enthusiasm might have fade, uh, faded a bit at the middle and end of these kinds of sessions, as still a success because we've introduced people to the idea of IPM. Uh, another couple of communication tips that were found to be helpful uh, are having some public meetings and inviting people to learn a little bit about how pests are managed. Uh, and so here's an example of some public meetings that we held last year from uh, East Bay Municipal Utility District, where over the course of uh, a couple of a couple of weeks, we had five different meetings that took place and invited the public to come in and hear a little bit about how we did what we did and opportunity to talk a little bit about how tools are used under certain circumstances and, and perhaps not in other circumstances. So uh, a good tool that takes time and energy, but we found it to be helpful and useful and, and just being available to answer people's questions. Uh, another tool that we're found to be useful is uh, to have handouts in the trucks of staff that are out actually doing the work. So again, examples from East Bay Mud, uh, and, and, and I apologize for maybe kind of the graininess of this photo, but what this is is a, is a fourfold uh, pamphlet that exists that shows uh, some of the information that if a member of the public was interested in learning more, uh, if the staff person out doing the work just felt uh, that the conversation might go better by having a pamphlet, here's what they could be handed. And so this is just the front side of one of the pamphlets to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which IPM is implemented regarding plants and rodents, uh, insects. And here's the second or the back side of that page that tries to convey this message that IPM is one that uh, is a tool that involves a variety of different approaches, mulching, burning, mowing, grazing, et cetera. So we found that to be uh, a good tool. And it's actually helped the staff that have been out in the field to feel a little bit more at ease and not feel that they alone are responsible for uh, carrying the message of IPM, that they have some help, if you will, in regard to being able to hand out this pamphlet. So uh, the IPM plan formulation, seven steps to success. Uh, and let me just briefly go through this and, and we can, and I know we're, we're running short on time here, Matt, so, I'll uh, get to it here and get this wrapped up. Uh, it's super important to have a leader. It's, I can't overemphasize that. So uh, it's, it's critical to find that person that's the driving force to, to make this all happen. Uh, the assemblage of stakeholders is critical so that uh, nobody's feeling left out. Having some local provincial knowledge is, uh, is a good, good idea. Uh, I mentioned earlier this idea of being able to see a stop sign and say safe. Well, I think this idea of identifying uh, objectives and then using examples to illustrate their importance is uh, a big part of being successful here. The definition of UCIPM is a great one. Uh, it's, it's one that people argue about as to whether or not it's complete enough, whether or not it's limited enough, but you have to start somewhere. And so we've found that that's a good place to start. The sharing of drafts and dialogue and then comparing your, your plan to other like entities we've found is good. Nobody, I think, uh, always feels comfortable blazing a path and being the first to develop an IPM plan uh, in a particular region. And so comparing other plans to your plans, not a bad idea. Uh, public input is important. And then of course, sharing it amongst the, your, your, your constituents is uh, another good idea. Uh, here's some of the key elements of an IPM plan. They mirror a lot of what the UC definition uh, includes. And I'll just point out that the sixth one, education and outreach, not explicitly stated in the UC uh, definition, but I would uh, emphasize that these are important elements of what a plan should include and critical to its success. What an IPM plan is not, I think is a, an important concept to take into account. And so we've walked into many circumstances where people thought that an IPM plan was a pesticide reduction or elimination plan. And of late, uh, this last, 18 months or so, people have thought that, well, really what we're trying to do is eliminate glyphosate use and let's just call it an IPM plan. Well, um, these are things that an IPM plan probably shouldn't be called. Uh, so be aware that perhaps these are things that people have in mind. And so the, the board that you see at the right is just an illustration of uh, how somebody started with the IPM concept on the right side 
and then migrated their thinking over to, well, it's not glyphosate, so it must be other herbicides that we're using. Uh, this is not what uh, we'd like to see an IPM develop into. So uh, it's always a good idea to end a talk like this with a quiz. And so for you that, for those of you that are, that are not in California, uh, this is an unfair quiz. I wouldn't expect you to know the answer to this, but my question to you is if you can name this well-known IPM practitioner, uh, uh, Matt, you'll have to decide what the award is for that. I'll give people uh, maybe a few seconds to see if they recognize that face and that body language. And then Matt, if you've gotten answers, uh, coming in, um, I can verify the, the accuracy of those answers if you've got any. So if, if anybody has an answer, just go ahead and type it in the chat. I think I may know who that is. You think you might know? I'll narrow it down to, uh, he's, a, he's kind of a Bay Area guy. Any answers? Oh yeah, so there's two so far in okay. the chat. One is from me, that's Andrew Sutherland. And the other one is from Jim Farrar, who is the IPM director, uh, you know, California State IPM coordinator. Okay. And he said, I, international IPM award winner, Andrew. <laughs> well, I, I, I tend to like that second uh, definition better than just straight up first and last name. So uh, thanks for that, Jim, you're exactly right. That's uh, Andrew in action. He was an invited speaker to uh, talk to some IPM practitioners. Uh, I think this is probably about a year or so ago. So that, uh, that concludes my talk. Uh, this is how, if you care to reach out to me, uh, you can. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all. And thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Um, I don't know if we have a lot of questions. Uh, I haven't seen any yet come up in the chat. I do have a question, but we're a little short on time. So um, maybe if it's a quick answer, otherwise maybe we can follow up later. I'm curious how broadly applicable the IPM plans that you develop for individual municipalities might be across other cities in the West. I'd say it knows no bounds. I, uh, I, I see broad applicability. Uh, I would uh, footnote that comment though with, it requires uh, this idea of uh, some trust building, some rapport building and some education. Education both with uh, the consumers of the IPM product as well as those that are providing it. Yep. Makes sense. Thanks Mike. You're welcome. So I think, that's, I think that's all we have for questions. I'm not seeing any in the chat. Okay. And I don't see any hand, let's see, I don't see any hands raised. Nope. All right. Okay. Thanks again. You're welcome. So our next speaker is Gino Graziano from University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Hey, Gino. Uh, Gino, do you want to try sharing your slides to make sure that works? Yeah, and I can do that. I'll go ahead and give the introduction while you go ahead and share your slides. So um, Gino is the invasive plants instructor at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Portland in biology, a master's degree from Alaska Pacific University in environmental science and a PhD from University of Alaska in Fairbanks in the area of natural resources and sustainability. He has worked in the Alaska Department, before working at the university there in, in Fairbanks, he worked at the Alaska Department of Natural Resources and the Alaska Association of Conservation Districts in the areas of invasive plants and pest management. He also has experience working on water and irrigation issues in Oregon and, Oregon and Alaska. Today, he will talk about non-target impacts of basal bark treatments to control, and I hope I have this uh, common name correct, uh, European bird cherry in Alaska. That's it. Yeah, the only correction I have is I'm, I'm still working on that PhD at UAF, um, but I'm almost there. I've got just a couple more years of data and stuff like that, but this is all part of it. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll get right into it. Um, we're going to talk about assessing non-target impacts. Um, to plants from uh, basal bark treatments of Prunus patus um, in Alaska. That's the European bird cherry. Um, and um, just to make sure we're uh, um, 
uh, note our funders. Um, this was initially start, uh, started funding by the Special Technology Development Program from the U.S. Forest Service. And I've had a lot of uh, other support from uh, uh, USDA and the Agricultural Forestry Experiment Station up in Fairbanks. Um, I'm actually located in, um, in Anchorage um, and, and kind of serve a statewide role uh, with UAF in the Extension Service Program for uh, Invasive Plants Management uh, Research and Education. So there we go. So uh, bird cherry, Prunus patus, the background on this, it's the, in the picture here, this is a forested area in an Anchorage Park and the little white flowers are, are um, um, from the bird cherry trees. So widely planted ornamental. Um, uh, we at UAF promoted it for years um, uh, because it's hardy, uh, produces cherries that attract birds and is generally not damaged by moose. Um, started getting planted in Alaska in around the 1950s or so. Um, we started noticing it becoming a problem or spreading in the early 2000s, and, um, and that led to some studies of it um, and, and surveys found it's fairly widely distributed in the state. This um, um, map here is from our Alaska Exotic Plant Information Clearinghouse, or AC Epic as we call it and uh, shows some location information around the state. Um, most of the um, infestations are obviously near uh, urban areas or, or rural um, communities. Uh, but some of the studies that looked into it found it was toxic to moose that contains um, um, cyanogenic glycosides that can cause cyanide poisoning in some instances. And that's happened on some, um, some rare occasions um, in, the, in the state, usually with, uh, uh, with calves. Uh, but also there was a study looking at um, salmon food webs and found that that this tree supports fewer terrestrial insects that fall into the streams compared to our native trees and shrubs. And that can actually make up about 20, 30% of what a, uh, a young salmon that's still living in the streams is going to be eating. So there came to be some concern for um, this tree and it's, it's, it's spread in the woods and forests. Uh, and potential habitat issues because of it. And so um, uh, people wanted to control it. And you, herbicide management's necessary with this because if you can't just cut the tree down, um, it, it'll sprout back on the stump. Um, it also will sucker out from its roots. So you really have to kill that, that root area um, to get it. So obviously there's broadcast foliar. In Alaska, the communities have been really uh, hesitant um, for kind of broadcast treatments. And, and we're still working on talking to folks about you know, some of the better ways to, to use broadcast and when it's really make them comfortable with, um, with some more broadcast type treatments, foliar treatments. Um, but uh, so initially though, a lot of the treatments with herbicides started with these, these real direct treatments. I'm looking at frill treatments where you cut into the trunk of the tree and um, um, squirt a small amount of herbicide in there or cut stump treatments, um, you know, cut the tree down and you paste some herbicide onto that stump. When you do these types of treatments, they have to, the treatment of herbicide has to come right after you make that damage to the tree because the trees will compartmentalize that injury and, um, um, and then the herbicide won't absorb in through, um, through those cuts. So, so that's your one logistical issue. The second um, being that those frill treatments were, are actually pretty hard to, to do. Um, oftentimes people will use an ax to bark on these um, from the applicators I talked to, um, and kind of more conducive to being cut with a saw. And so it just became really time consuming. And uh, with, with the cut stump treatments, um, your, your biggest issue is dealing with that, um, that waste. The tree you cut down, um, we can actually get um, these trees to re-sprout um, um, and re-root um, under the right conditions. So it doesn't happen 100% um, of the time, but it happens enough of the time that you have to dispose of the tops of the trees um, in order to, to, do, uh, to do that. And so they have to be um, you know, cut up for firewood if they're big enough or, and, um, and chipped um, in order to do that. So it makes for um, a little, quite a bit more labor. So uh, applicators have moved towards um, with trees that are appropriate size using um, injections. Um, those are shown in the bottom left picture. Um, and then basal bark treatments, which are shown in the uh, bottom right picture. And the basal bark treatments are what we're going to focus on. Um, basal bark treatments are where you um, spray a, uh, um, your herbicide mixed in with a mineral oil onto the bark of the tree. Um, and you, you spray the bottom 12 to 18 inches um, the whole way around. 
Um, these applications are are direct, which is which is nice. So you um, uh, limit some of those non-target impacts. Um, but they also um, are, have a really wide window of of application. You can see there's no leaves on the trees now, so you can do dormant applications with basal bark treatments as long as there's no snow on the ground. Now, um, I became aware of some potential non-target impacts from these basal bark treatments after um, um, applicators in Anchorage started telling me like, hey, every once in a while we do this and all of a sudden you see these kind of, you know, uh, areas where, the, you know, nothing's really growing underneath these trees. Um, and so, and, and the, you know, there, there could be a lot of ways this happens, um, and we'll get into that a little bit, but, uh, uh, but it's not actually that uncommon for people to have noted that, that herbicides can actually leak out of trees after, or leak out of plants after direct treatments. There's been some studies looking at mesotrione on seed potatoes. Um, that, that found those uh, um, um, seed potatoes when they were replanted um, um, were able to get, leak the uh, mesotrione out of the tuber and affect nearby tubers and then leafy spurge, or, spurge and picloram. And, and recently, I don't have them cited here, but they're starting to, uh, with, with Roundup ready plants, um, try to actually see if, is that glyphosate still in there? And they're showing that, wow, the glyphosate's actually coming out of those root systems. So this, um, you know, it can happen in a lot of ways. There's so many things that are going on underneath the uh, the ground layer that, that that roots are doing. They're constantly growing. They're they're using mucilage to uh, both uh, uh, lubricate their their roots as they grow through the soil, but they're also using that mucilage to to um, interact with nutrients and microorganisms and create um, you know basically get what they need, water, nutrients, et cetera, and also to start to shed um, and release secondary compounds that they don't need or maybe they're for protection. Um, root parts are, can also be really small. You know, they have border cells and, and root hairs that are constantly being shed and falling off. And any of these things, especially when you use um, um, oxen type herbicides that, that go to the growing tips, um, can have that herbicide in them. And when they, um, those, those uh, plant cells start to decompose, um, if the herbicide's there, then that gets released out into um, the soil rhizosphere and could potentially um, impact other plants. So we wanted to ask is, um, you know, do these basal bark treatments result in the non-target impact from herbicide residues? Uh, from release from treated plants and does herbicide choice or application timing change um, effectiveness of basal bark treatments? So can, can we do boy, um, um, dormant treatments uh, effectively? So we looked at this um, in, in a lab scenario first. Um, I took cuttings and rooted them um, in, the, in, a, in the lab and uh, um, actually let them grow for quite a while so that the, uh, the roots were no longer, uh, you know, the, the plant was no longer had any damage. And then we treated these with um, the, the rates you see there, uh, zero rate, uh, zero uh, control, 5% or 1X rate, 2X um, label rate, 4X, 8X. We'd used amino pyrrolid. Um, the reason we used amino pyrrolid is because it is um, uh, labeled for use in basal bark treatments. Um, it is also um, really persistent um, in Alaska soils. And so it actually presents one of the best opportunities to kind of study if, if um, herbicides are coming out of the roots of a plant. We apply 10 microliters of a mixture as, as what's called on a label a stem bark band treatment. And so in stem bark band, it differs from the basal bark treatment because you do it higher up on the stem, you go right below the first, first branch. Um, we had a, a group of these that were controlled and you'll see them labeled as D or drip off later when I start talking about um, them in the graphs. And the ones that were the controls, they received these amino pyrrolid treatments, um, but they, they were um, tipped on their side to prevent runoff for one hour. And really all the plants were tipped on their side uh, to prevent runoff, runoff for one hour so that that herbicide had chance to uh, um, um, absorb in there. But the, the ones that were the drip off controls, um, which was three, three plants um, in, in those, each of those treatments, the um, uh, dose treatments, they were taken um, after that first hour and put directly into the freezer in their little baggie. Um, you can see the bags below there. And then they were um, left on their side in the freezer. Um, and what we were testing there was um, trying to demonstrate is, is minimizing the chance to basically nothing that any of that herbicide, that 10 microliters, which is a tiny amount, would actually go down the stem 
and into the uh, um, and, and run off uh, the stem essentially into the soil. Um, the rest of them were uh, put um, the the remaining ones were put into the free or into the growth chamber up in the upper right and al allowed to um, have grow for three weeks after treatment. Um, and then we used a, a bioassays um, of the soil with, um, with a plant a weed up here that's really susceptible to um, amino pyrrolid, uh, it's called Crepus tectorum. And then we also um, extracted amino pyrrolid from the soil. So our bioassays, like I said, was with Crepus tectorum. Um, we put those in that growth chamber again and allowed them to grow for three weeks after a treatment. And then we assessed herbicide damage. Um, we didn't see any, but uh, um, the dry weight of, of a plant um, is also uh, an acceptable way of, of determining if there's herbicides in, in soils from bioassay or effective herbicides um, in soils to, to a bioassay plant. And so we determine the dry weight of these and that's primarily what we see here. And so what you can see from this graph is, is we have um, the, the drip off controls, those are in blue and the red ones are the, um, the trees that went through the entire um, uh, three weeks in the growth chamber. Um, and you can see in the zero X control, we have, we have bigger plants. Um, they have, they have a heavier weight than the rest of them. Um, and this also held true with um, the amount that germinated um, in those that was higher for the controls than, than most of the other treatments as well. And so this is just evidence that there is some um, effect of the herbicide uh, biologically going on in that, in that soil after these treatments. Um, and then here's our corresponding, this is our, our um, from the amino pyrrolid extractions in soil, uh, the average part per billion amino pyrrolid concentration in soil. And what you can see here is two things. One, um, the, the drips, the blues had a minimal amount of herbicide that did get out into the soil from them. Um, we think that is actually because the plant itself has absorbs that herbicide. And even after you put it in the freezer um, in that hour, it doesn't, the, the tree itself doesn't immediately go dormant. There's still a while where it's, um, it's, it's waiting to freeze essentially in, the, in that freezer that it's still circulating herbicide through and is able to potentially release some of that into, um, into the soil, possibly even a, a larger amount at, at a single time when, when it successfully freezes those roots down there if any of the cells actually lice um, during that time period. But um, those are all just theories, but suffice to say that, that that herbicide does get there. We do have a higher amount though, um, that's showing up in those full treatments, uh, the ones that stayed in the uh, um, growth chamber for three weeks, and it goes up um, as, the, uh, um, um, uh, as the treatment rate goes up. So we also did this out in the field um, to couple the lab experiments. And so we did, uh, we wanted to look at, at herbicide choice, application timing. Um, um, can we treat these trees when there's no snow on the ground, but they're, they're dormant. Um, and so this is just a picture of one of the trees and with its corresponding label for its treatments. So we did our field treatments in uh, Fairbanks and also in Anchorage. We did them in August and then in September, our trees start to lose their leaves in September up here. And uh, um, our treatments were control. Um, we did one control with just basil oil to see if the basil oil had any impact. And then we did an amino pyrrolid treatment. We used triclopyr. This is the butoxyethyl ester um, Garlon 4. And then a, a tank mix of triclopyr and amino pyrrolid to look at these. And then we um, assessed the um, uh, various things with these trees uh, before and after their treatments. The things I'm going to focus on today are the bottom three, the defoliation of the treated trees, non-target impacts, um, and then we had collected soil samples as well. As well. Um, we didn't really have a great idea of, of where to, um, you know, it, it's kind of like a needle in a haystack. Where's the tree actually going to release the herbicide underneath this? Because you don't, you don't really know where the roots are going. So we randomly selected um, um, two different directions to come off the tree that were exactly opposite of each other um, and did, um, um, it went out to the drip line distance to get eight total samples um, of on you know, four in each direction, unless those samples were um, less than 30 centimeters from each other or about a foot. Um, so first thinking about 
damage that we assessed um, to non-target trees. So it, it was noticeable. Um, it was kind of sporadic. Um, I'll show you some numbers here um, in a minute, but um, this picture here on the right, that's a um, aminopyrrolid treated bird cherry tree that you can see is just dead um, in the middle. It has the little green, um, greenish blue band of spray paint on the on the trunk there. And next to it, you can see a spruce tree. Um, we we you know, remember we only sprayed the the bark of this. Uh, um, prunus tree and that spruce tree, um, you can see the brown tips on the uh, um, the branches. Well, spruce happen to be really susceptible to amino pyrrolid um, in, in soils. And uh, um, this tree had those those brown tips. They they went up the, the tree, um, mostly just on that side of the uh, um, of the tree. But we saw non-target damage only from about 11 of our treated trees um, in, in June 2018. So uh, when you think about that, uh, we had um, a total of four different treatments um, and five uh, or four different areas with five herbicide treatments, three herbicide treatments in each of those areas um, and five trees in each herbicide treatment. So that's um, 15 trees uh, per time and, uh, um, and area. So about 60 trees and we only had 11, um, 11 treated trees that actually had any um, non-target damage that was observable. And this is the way that breaks down. So for amino pyrrolid treatments, we had six trees, um, uh, amino pyrrolid and triclopyrrid and the take mix, we only had four trees um, that had any non-target damage. And then with triclopyr itself, we had one tree. And then in 2019, that um, dropped off uh, with only five trees that we have observed any non-target damage nearby and that was in, um, in for amino pyrrolid treatments and then you can see some of the the damage that we we documented there there's uh, the one on the far right is a willow with some curling leaves and then if you you got to look close on the other one but you can see a cow parsnip or some people call it pushki up here uh, that's right around that tree uh, it's, it's a relative of giant hogweed if you're not familiar with it and it um the, uh, those, those leaves are curling as well. So we, again, assessed how much amino pyrrolid was actually in the soils from these. And so we have two different um, um, ways of looking at this. We have our, our detections, um, which are, um, you know, is there anything that the, the instrument could actually find at all? And then we have ha whether or not it was, it was quantitative, if we could actually determine what the uh, uh, quantity was on there. And so, uh, um, half a part per billion is our method detection limit and then 1.2 part per billion is our limit of quantification and you can see we had about eight detections in amino pyrrolid uh, 12 detections in amino pyrrolid and triclopyr um, no detections of amino pyrrolid in the triclopyr treatments it's, and and as well as the controls um, those matched up the ones where we had detections of amino pyrrolid matched up with um, uh, six of our non-targets that were observed um, they three of those um, actually had amino pyrrolid that we detected in the soil. And then uh, um, um, in the same with the amino pyrrolid and triclopyr of those four that um, or 12 that we were able to detect it, three of those actually had um, um, uh, noted non-target impacts in there. And then, and that's just to, to say really that, um, you know, we can observe where the non-target impacts are happening. Uh, but then when we come back and randomly select where to choose the soils, we might, we might miss, um, you know, a small amount of that amino pyrrolid that's getting out. And we're, amino pyrrolid can be um, really effective at really small concentrations on, on a variety of plants. So we could be seeing um, non-target impacts at really, really low doses on, on, uh, um, on some of these plants. All right, now we also did bioassays of our field samples, um, kind of a visual of what we're looking at here is over on the right. Um, the top um, two, the, the very first one on the top is, is a control. Um, so it was just sprayed with water, just below that is kind of sprayed with basil oil, below that is sprayed with just triclopyr. Um, and then the se second from the bottom is, is the tank mix, triclopyr and aminopyrrolid. And then the final one is aminopyrrolid. And you can see that playing out in our, um, in our graphs here, where we have you know, a significantly larger plants growing out of our controls and basal oils than we do with our um, um, treatments that had aminopyrrolid in them. Uh, the triclopyr treatment didn't really seem to be that um, um, super affected by, 
um, by that, even though it looks a little bit smaller. Um, effectiveness, though, we're getting um, this was measured in 2018 and 2019. I went ahead and did the 2019 um, for this graph because the uh, um, if you've done basal bark treatments in, uh, before, you it takes a while for that herbicide to really get through that tree and actually kill it. So you see um, two years out from your treatment um, is when you really start to see the maximum amount of defoliation on these on these trees. And so what we're looking Looking at here is that uh, basically aminopyrrolid and um, triclopyr and those um, tank mix of the two don't really have any significant differences in control. Um, when you split that up by when they were treated, fall versus summer, um, we also don't really see any um, significant differences in control there either. Um, so, which is great because that means, um, you know, as long as it's not raining and there's no snow on the ground, um, we can get out and have a somewhat of an extended season to, um, to make these treatments. So, some next steps. Um, we're still working on um, uh, getting our, our um, herbicide analysis for the field soil samples for triclopyr. Uh, we need to do that with a GC. We tried for a while with the, to do it tandem with the LCMS, but it didn't work. And now our GC is not working. So um, we're, we're getting there, though. Um, we're also, we've got new funding from USDA um, and the HATCH program to scale up the project and determine if these non-target impacts increase. And so on the right, you see um, a bunch of planted uh, um, prunus trees that I um, put out there. They're in, in little plots of um, uh, two, or I think it's one, two, and six trees per square meter. And we're going to treat those trees with uh, um, aminopyrrolid and triclopyr next year and um, see if we uh, get any sort of increase in amount of non-target impacts that we can observe there, um, as well as look at the soil um, concentrations that are in there. And we're also going to couple that with work out in the invaded forest. So we're essentially taking what we did, which was treat an individual tree. I think I forgot to go over that. Um, we treated just an individual tree to isolate that um, effects of that treatment um, in the surrounding area of that tree. And then we stepped away and, and um, far enough away that those trees wouldn't interact with each other with each treatment. And so the big question remains is, is so then what happens when you put this at a practical applicator level of, of treating you know, several acres of these trees and, and in varying densities and at what density do we start to see increased damage? So in summary though, we're getting pretty good control um, uh, regardless of season or herbicide choice. These non-target impacts exist. Um, they do appear to be kind of slight though. Um, we need to you know, mimic larger scale uh, um, control, but really like uh, um, for the most part, I think uh, uh, at least on the individual tree level, they can sort of be avoided um, the non-target impacts either by careful application or herbicide choice. If there's really no non-target impacts are tolerable in a situation, then um, possibly using something, um, either a different application method um, or something that um, has less persistence in the soil could, could really decrease that. I'll take some questions if we got some time. I think, I think I've got a little bit. Yeah, yeah, you're good. Um, I'm not seeing any questions yet in the chat. Oh, here we go. So this is from Jim Farrar. Did any of the impacted non-target plants die? Right, so we weren't really able to um, track that. That's something I wish we would have done, especially for some of those um, woody trees. Um, like I saw that one willow um, that we saw, if I could have marked that and gone back and been like, ooh, is it still there? Um, a lot of the uh, um, um, you know herbaceous vegetation, it, it wouldn't be practical because you know it's dying down and coming back um, you know the next year for us to do that. So what we're hoping to do is, is get um, with these new plot level experiments is to set up a, a really robust um, um, vegetation sampling um, in these plots so that we can track how that changes um, over time. Um, so, you know, we'll know how many willows and how many, you know, dwarf dogwoods, et cetera, were, you know, in this square meter and we'll come measure that square meter again. So we have a second question from Mike Blankenship. He says, great talk, Gino. I may have missed it, 
was basil oil used as an adjuvant for all applications? Yes, basil oil. We used uh, basil oil blue, um, and I think I forgot to mention that. So, Here's another question from Sherry Rosenquist from Arizona. She asks, target trees or um, target trees on flat or sloped landscape? Generally flat, um, I'd say. So one, in Fairbanks, it was um, in an ag field where there was a windrow in an experiment for us, and that was as, as flat as it gets. Um, and then in, in Anchorage, they were in natural forests, um, but it's uh, in a riparian area, so they're still you know, pretty darn flat. Um, right. you know, there might be little hummocks and things like that, but otherwise really flat. Yeah. And this is not a question that's in the chat, but this was mentioned by Steve before you joined us. He said he wanted to see what the view looked like out of your window. Oh, I think we could see your window behind you, right? Yeah, I got to take you to a different one. You have to bear with the uh, um, the walking thing, uh, walking. You guys still there? There you are. Oh yeah. See what you can see here. If that, okay, there we go. Yeah, we've got probably a foot of snow by now. If you can see that. Yeah. So. Very nice. It's been a very good fall and beginning winter. Outstanding. All righty. I think that's all we have for questions. Uh, Steve, unless there's any other images you would like to see oh, before we depart. Fine. I wanted to see. I thought you were up in Fairbanks, too. So oh, no, no, no. It's OK. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm in Anchorage. That, that time when you met me in, uh, in Anchorage, yeah. I had just gotten back from Fairbanks, but um, that was uh, that was a whirlwind of, of field work for a peony project, but uh, yeah, the no, we're I'm, I'm based out of Anchorage. It's much colder up there, but they have they have good snow this year too. Okay. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Thank you to both uh, Michael and and Gino for presenting today. Uh, I do want to mention that the next installment of the IPM Hour will be January thirteenth. Uh, so I'm hoping that you will all be able to join us. Uh, you will see. The speaker list come out um, in the newsletter. Um, uh, that will come out the what is it the second first Wednesday. Yeah, first Wednesday. First Wednesday of January. Yep. So thank you all very much and enjoy your holiday season. It looks like Gina will have a white Christmas. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks everyone.